Hi, everybody, and a warm welcome to the Roadmap for Cloud Infrastructure Success in 2022. Uh, in this webinar, Service Australia, um, partnership with VMware, will discuss some cutting edge approaches to advancing your cloud technology infrastructure. Uh, we've had hundreds of attendees uh, registering for this over the past few weeks, and we've got a great lineup of panelists that I'm going to introduce in a second. Um, but before that, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land. I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging, for they hold the memories, the traditions and the culture of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across the nation. Um, just a little bit about Service Australia. Uh, we're a leading cloud service provider through a range of different solutions, such as um, private cloud, hybrid cloud, dedicated servers and co-location. Um, and I'd like to continue by introducing our panelists. So we've got Peter Batunin, who's the CTO and co-owner of Service Australia. Uh, we've got Shanae Swinney from VMware. She's a cloud provider solutions engineer, and she works very closely with uh, cloud service providers. Uh, we've got Harry Jensen, who is a director at Equinix, who are the world's largest data center uh, provider. And we've got Dennis Go, who is a cloud solutions architect, um, and he specializes in networking and security with VMware. And um, we're going to go over to Pete, and he's going to kick off the conversation around uh, current challenges for small to medium businesses and startups. And um, he'll also be discussing the importance of data resilience in today's in cloud environment. So over to you, Pete. Okay. Again, I'd like to welcome all the panelists and attendees for attending this event today. Um, today, I'll be discussing the current cloud market and the challenges faced by SMEs and startups. Um, initially, I want to start talking about uh, the elephant in the room, COVID. I mean, wow, that's changed everything um, that we can all agree on. Um, working from home is the new standard. Um, it's, it's, it's caused a lot of issues and stresses to businesses, um, especially when it comes to connectivity performance issues. Um, a lot of people, um, are business owners um, in the SME market have not equated for what it takes to run um, cloud workloads remotely um, because a lot of the, their internet connections aren't big enough to sustain these sort of connectivity from the amount of stuff they have. Um, but these will somewhat be dampened by the likes of MBN. Um, even Elon Musk's new Starlink has enabled uh, rural cities to experience a massive amount of growth um, but has even put more pressure on, on, on the likes of cloud and, and making sure workloads can deliver the sort of connectivity needed. And um, the one thing that also oversees all of this is security. Um, it's even a bigger issue now because now not only do you have your offices and stuff, um, you have endpoints now that you need to be worried about the connectivity, what internet connections are going through, are they safe, are they secure? Um, this will be covered a lot more by Dennis from VMware um, later on in the, in the webinar uh, with the importance of this in detail. Um, now, some, some of the changes uh, that's happened in the cloud workspace. Now, from a report um, we've read from Remote Work Statistics, approximately 34% of all workers now prefer to work in the cloud and, all, and, and even are suggesting that they will now admit, uh, are admitting to working even more um, in, in environments which enable them to actually work remotely. Um, another crazy statistics uh, that Gartner quotes that in 2020, the total worth of the cloud market um, was in, in excess of $371 billion. Now, um, they also state with a compound that they expect to see a compounded growth of 17.5%, which is projected that this market would amount to about $832 billion by 2025. Now, the way I personally interpret, interpret this number is that SMEs haven't migrated to the cloud yet. Um, we all must agree that most of enterprise has. They've embraced it. Uh, they have the capacity to move to it. Um, but the reason why is because there's a lot of complexity and a lot of cost and refactoring, which I'll more, uh, discuss in more detail a little bit later. Um, another thing is um, cloud. It's not just hyperscalers. We are seeing a huge shift in what SMEs see the cloud as. Um, in the same report, Gartner stated that 85% of infrastructure strategies will be a mix of on-prem, co-location, cloud, and edge computing when, when compared to 20% today. Um, businesses are realizing hybrid cloud workloads um, will enable a balanced level of cost for self-management. And we're seeing more and more uh, SMEs having their core workloads and 
uh, with cloud providers, but also managing specific targeted workloads themselves. Um, I guess the one question all SMEs should be asking is where can they find it elsewhere and, and rather than building it themselves. Um, another one um, point I want to focus on is the rise of hybrid digital infrastructure management tools. Now, this word is um, a word that's appeared only in the last through several years, um, and the likes of VMware have made it very transparent, uh, very apparent, should I say. Um, and it's the key enabler for decision makers to transition their workloads to the cloud. Um, and there's a huge shift from traditional hyperscalers because of the likes of VMware. I won't go into too much details because one of our panelists, uh, Sinead, she'll be discussing VMware's part enabling hybrid cloud with their digital infrastructure management tools. So next, um, this is a subject I'm very, very, very passionate about, which is data availability, data resilience, and data restoration times. Now, data availability, um, building data availability across multiple availability zones is not, a, is not an easy task. Um, I will acknowledge that hyperscales have changed the world, but I've also introduced a complexity level that, is, that truly in, inhibits a lot of SMEs migrating to cloud. Um, there's some challenges that SMEs have faced. Um, one, one big word is refactoring. Um, what that means is your current workload, your current infrastructure has to be rebuilt, redesigned uh, by developers to fit into the hyperscales platform. They can't really just move their workloads and plug it in there with ease usually. Um, you also have, so there's a need of developers, there's a need of network administrators, um, making sure plat one platforms are available through you know, um, load balances and availability. And there's a, I'm not going to go into too much complex details um, just, just for the attendees, but th there becomes a, a responsibility for end SMEs to manage that. And to be honest, it is way beyond the reach of most Australian SMEs. Um, and the cost, um, it is nearly double because you're always going to have to double your workloads, have highly available database servers and web servers. And, and then there comes a, a, a situation where complex issues arise and maintenance is difficult. Um, I will acknowledge enterprise workloads um, have achieved, achieved this successfully already. I mean, we all understand they've got the money, they have the budget, um, but we are here to talk about SMEs, right, and startups, the people that are, you know, haven't migrated to the, work, uh, to the, to the cloud yet. Um, these days, SMEs can have resilience built into their platform and not worry about designing HA into the software layer across multiple availability zones. And the way we achieve this is by a product called vSAN. I won't go into too much technical detail about it, but what it does is basically allows your uh, database servers, your web servers, your file servers to be replicated into a second availability zone with zero, um, zero latency time. So basically what you're achieving is removing the complexity of building availability into your application and taking it to the layer underneath, which manages the replication and stuff. Um, the next part of my uh, um, discussion will be around data resilience, um, ransomware attacks um, and SMEs responsibilities. Now, I get very emotional when it comes to this. I think um, what I'm trying to say here is business owners and cloud providers all have the same responsibility when it comes to ensuring your staff and clients data is protected. I can't stress that enough. It's actually not one person's responsibility. It's, a, it's an ecosystem from the provider and the actual business owners. Um, attacks will get through whether they're socially engineered, opportunistic attacks, zero day exploits, which no one can really stop unless they know about it. And then the biggest one, believe it or not, is human mistakes. They equate for like 74% of all ransomware attacks. Now, one thing I want to say, um, in this life, we, 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 we insure everything. We insure cars, we insure um, uh, jewellery, houses, we insure even income. All of these can actually be um, replaced technically. The one thing that cannot be replaced is data. You can't actually restore lost data if you don't have another copy of it. Um, and lastly, the last subject I want to talk about is real world recovery times. Um, a lot of the technical people know this as RTO, recovery time objective. Now, a lot of businesses around Australia only run backups when they need it. Now, this is planning to fail. Monthly reports are not good enough. I mean, at a minimum, all businesses should do a test run of the restore at least every six months, if not every three months. You need to ensure that your backups and, and your DR is working. Um, no one tests recovery times. Um, Tim will vouch for this as well. Um, if I was to ask any business owner, how long would it take you to restore 10 terabytes? Most would say, I'm not too sure. 
Um, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an honest truth. Um, we have experienced firsthand, I mean, we sell a lot of unmanaged dedicated servers and when clients ask us to restore 10 terabytes, it can take Tim days on, on hand sometimes. Um, and so um, there, there is one final thought I wanna leave you with um, and it's one insight. Um, always take joy when sales engineers have a conversation with you or other clients, even if they don't get the sale, but succeed in educating them to make data availability, resilience, and the restoration times a thing in their mindsets. Um, because once you lose that, as I said, it's, it's hard to recover from. Um, but now I'll pass on to the next speaker, Tim. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Peter. So we're going to go across to Harry, who's going to um, talk to us about Equinix's role in you know, enabling cloud providers um, to build the solutions that they do in this day and age. Um, thank you very much, Harry. Thanks, Tim. Thanks for having me, everyone. Yes, yeah, so um, Equinix. Uh, a few technical points on how you know, we enable the cloud through our critical data centers. We call them IBXs, which is International Business Exchange, because they are more than just four walls, uh, power and cooling. A bit about Equinix first. We've got over 230 data centers globally. We have in 60 markets, five continents. We've got over 10,000 customers. So we've got a large global platform operating uh, and interconnecting on a daily basis. Services Australia is one of those who've got a great relationship with, and they rely on us for many things. And, and a couple that are up at the top of the list are reliability and connectivity. So if we start with reliability, our data centers are designed and operated to meet availability um, standards. And so the benchmark for data center availability is um, tier three. Tier three is three ninth of availability. And that's about one and a half hours of service interruption every year. This is clearly unacceptable for today's world, where our expectations of customers are 24 by seven, never down. You know, otherwise, you know, they're on social media and they're pretty upset with us straight away. Past that, uh, there are some other um, industry goes towards uh, tier four, which is four nines availability. That's about 26 minutes of service interruption each year. So things are starting to look up, but it's still not quite good enough. So Equinix by comparison, we have a, um, a service level agreement of five nines uh, availability. So that's five minutes and 15 seconds of service interruption every year. We're starting to look pretty good. And so that's a, a service level agreement that we give out. So the industry is at tier three at one and a half hours. And uh, you know how we design and build, we're at five minutes and, and 15 seconds. That said, our global record is six nines. And so that's better than 32 seconds of availability um, downtime per annum. So this is our bread and butter. This is the minimum of what's expected of us and reliability is the bedrock of all services that, that we want. And it's how we design, build and operate the system that sets us apart. It's our policies, processes, procedures, leveraging global in-house you know, engineering experts on all fronts that help us to get there. Second part I'd like to talk to you about is interconnection. So, um, and how we truly support cloud enablement. We make that possible through our local and global interconnection um, within and between our data centers and IBXs. It's our business core differentiator. We have literally thousands and tens of thousands of physical dark fibers and cross connects connecting all of our data centers with our customers. One of the products we have is Metro Connect, which connects our metropolitan data centers like they're in the same building, enabling customers to reach each other easily through point-to-point -point connections. We also have Equinix Internet Exchange. It's Australia's, which actually I think it's the world's largest peering platform for accessing all of our customers through online portals. And we have Equinix Fabric. And so if you want to connect globally and locally with anyone, distributed infrastructure through the software in our ecosystem. This will support the enablement of multi-cloud solutions for you. And finally, if I could add another one for our customer base, which spans all industries and requires us to have really strong security and compliance practice. So that includes all ISO certifications, 27001, 14001, SOC 1 and 2 for auditing, even security certifications into the future. We make sure that our ecosystem is certified for all customers 
that, that expect it, large and small. So in summary, uh, Equinix provides a reliable, secure and interconnected data center solution that enables the cloud. Awesome, thank you very much, Harry. I think that's truly interesting to hear how data center providers can, you know, provide those kind of uptime numbers these days is just amazing. Um, and, you know, someone like Equinix having multiple data centers will, you know, that's why we use Equinix so we can provide solutions such as vSAN, replicate data between availability zones, um, you know, provide high availability and other solutions, disaster recovery if a site goes down, you know, you've got other sites there that we can have data ready to go. You know, there's really awesome things that data center providers are doing to, you know, move us into the future um, when it comes to cloud technology. So thank you very much, Harry. And um, so that's the, the backbone of the cloud uh, industry. And, um, you know, for cloud to be realized, you need some software on top. And VMware, you know, they're, they're the leaders in virtualization and software enabling cloud. So I'm going to go over to Sinead Swinney, who's going to talk to us about how VMware enables cloud, um, you know, in this day and age. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. Um, uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm one of the cloud solutions architects uh, from VMware, as Tim introduced earlier. Uh, I just want to touch on a little bit around uh, hybrid cloud and workload management uh, for what that means for VMware in the uh, in the era uh, of uh, several uh, cloud services available to um, um, all the enterprises. As VMware, we have a broad range of uh, private and public cloud solutions uh, that uh, is actually available to all our cloud providers. Um, when I say cloud provider, I work very closely with Service of Australia is, uh, is one of my main focus of the cloud provider. Um, and it gives uh, them a choice uh, to uh, give you ability to have your workloads wherever you like to have them. It can be in your data center, uh, it can be in, in the uh, public cloud. The, the definition of the public cloud depends on how you define it, that we help all, uh, um, Service of Australia to create the public cloud that you do use as today. And uh, the, um, uh, uh, the uh, VMware cloud providers platform is actually uh, is a defined ecosystem uh, for for the um, cloud providers. It's designed from ground up uh, for to meet all the um, enterprise and um, cloud based solutions and the application needs that you guys might have to um, enable you to grow your business. Uh, it is uh, based on uh, developed based on the uh, current VMware technology, so the hybridity and the integration that you're looking for uh, is is in the uh, main focus, um, and it is based on um, a technology called VMware Cloud Director is um, uh, used uh, heavily by um, uh, cloud providers. Also, seamlessly integrates and provisions uh, uh, um, the cloud computing resources that you might need. Um, also integrates with all the other solutions and allows cloud providers to create, um, uh, create services likes of DR as a service um, and, and other type of services that you may need. Um, the, uh, VMware Club uh, director we talked about uh, gives um, you the ability to have that um, self-service portal that a lot of, uh, you know, you might have enjoyed, uh, but might have got, gotten lost in the, uh, in the other platforms that uh, they, you know, you might want to, you know, use uh, to, uh, to provision uh, your own applications. Uh, so in the heart, we have uh, the cloud director, which integrates, uh, Dennis will talk about the, our uh, um, uh, networking 
and all, uh, all other uh, products as well. So it enables you to deploy, manage, and integrate your applications um, into your private environment. Um, uh, thanks, Dennis. Uh, uh, thanks, Tim. Um, it's over to you. Thanks, Sinead. Yeah, so we'll go over to Dennis now, who can uh, talk about the networking side and security of VMware and how they provide that um, via software. Thanks, Dennis. All right. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Sinead. So uh, VMware does offer a software-defined network, which is our VMware NSX, as you guys might already know. And what is the benefit to running a software-defined network? Not, not just NSX, it's right, because it's a software. So software can literally run on any hardware and make hardware agnostic. So VMware has gone into this um, path or this direction since the start using our virtualized uh, infrastructure, using our ESSIs, right, to essentially virtualize the hardware of the server itself to allow multiple virtual machines to run on the same hardware thinking that, you know, it's on different hardware. So that is where we are going with, with our VMware NSX. Since software allows users to run on any hardware, you can literally run the same software everywhere, right? That's the, that's the point. That's what we want to achieve with VMware. So you can run the same software, VMware NSX, from your on-prem all the way to your clouds and all the ages as well. And what are the benefits to running the same software? Right across across all environments, it's just like running, you know, your phone. If you're using an Android phone today, you will realize that when you switch from hardware vendor from one hardware vendor to another hardware vendor, whether you are using Samsung and you're moving towards a Huawei phone or you are moving towards a Vivo phone, right? As long as it is, it is running Android, Android is the overlay, you know, the, the software that sits on top of it, and from a user experience. This is where you experience the same consistent user interface and the same consistent policies, right? The same settings that you can configure are all the same. Of course, the underlying hardware will then power the software. I mean, if you go for a high-end Samsung phone, you have better cameras, better microphones, noise isolating microphones, so and so forth. And, and the software can take advantage of that. And if you run on a cheaper phone, then that's where software can take advantage of that. That's the key difference. Hardware is important, but software makes it consistent around. So when you have consistent software with VMware NFX, that leads you to have to have the ability to have a consistent network and security across all environments that you have. And imagine the scenario where you have an on-prem workload that is PCI DSS, and you have some workloads in the native public cloud, not hyper uh, hyper converged. Hyperscalers out there, and you have workloads sitting in Servers Australia, and you want to have the same security policy and the same network policy across all the same cloud workloads, for example, PCI DSS. And when you use VMware NSX, you can apply a certain set of um, security rules or policies on top of it, and it will then be pushed down to all environments, right? Be it on prem, be it hyperscalers, be it in, in the public cloud. Uh, in the cloud like service Australia as well. So that is the key benefits to running on uh, software defined open with VMware. So I hand it off to you, Tim. Thanks, Dennis. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Um, service Australia, like we use NSXT a lot in our, even on our own corporate workloads where we can define a single policy um, and it will apply, you know, to everything in our environment, which is really good. It saves time for one. You don't have to make specific uh, firewall rules for each, you know, different application or each different VM. Um, and you can also do um, micro segmentation, which we'll talk about a bit later, uh, which is protecting your workloads from each other. Uh, so, for example, Pete was saying about ransomware before. Like, if a VM gets ransomware, you know, usually the, the, the attacker will try and spread horizontally between your like your different endpoints in your environment. But using something like a software-defined um, security solution like NSX, for example, you could 
have rules that only allow very specific traffic between your different workloads. Uh, so it would block the, the threat from traversing horizontally through your environment. So it's situations like these and it's, you know, um, examples like these and problems like these that, that modern cloud providers are trying to solve. Um, and yeah, VMware is doing really awesome work with the NSX uh, suite of products. So that's really cool. Um, thanks, Dennis, for the, for the info on that one. Um, we've discussed a few different problems um, and potential solutions already. Um, and I think we should talk about, you know, how to, what, what, what's a, a solution as a whole that addresses all these different issues that we've raised. Um, so, you know, in summary, we've been working on a solution at Service Australia that, um, that covers all these bases. Like there are lots of little things that small businesses, small medium enterprise have to worry about and it can become overwhelming. Um, I think like, you know, you have to worry about security, networking, high availability, disaster recovery, backups. Um, there's all these different bases that you have to cover. Um, so we've been doing a lot of work to try and create something that covers all those bases and makes it simple for um, customers to use. So I'm going to introduce our new product, which is called um, Virtual Data Center. We call it VDC for short. Um, and I'm going to go to Pete to give a quick introduction and, yeah. and you know, how this, how this helps. Thanks, Tim. Um, so yeah, um, to build a solution where customers have dual availability zones, um, have disaster recovery, have your data replicated instantly to another uh, availability zone, having security built at every level, um, having, you know, extremely fast storage, having backup storage and allowing you to scale up and down as you see fit is a feat in itself. And what we decided to do over the last several years, as we became a VMware cloud a verified partner, um, we built something called VDC, Virtual Data Center. And what that, what the, the way we, I see that is, it's, as Tim said, a product that covers network, security, storage, compute, um, and application provisioning. Um, and what we've done is we built a system with our partners like Equinix and VMware and provided a solution where you can come in there, order your resources, provision your applications, whether they're um, pre-configured, custom. Um, we have native Terraform support as well on the platform. Um, it allows, uh, as I said, multi-cloud with NSXT. Um, it's secure. And most importantly, your self backups are self-service. Um, we have multiple storage options in terms of block and object. It allows customers to really easily use a single plane of glass to manage all their infrastructure without the technical complexity that traditional hyperscales have introduced. Um, and to do this, you need, you know, dark fibers between data centers. You need network switches and routers. And SMEs can't manage this these days. It's just too much. It's a job in itself. Or should I say multiple positions would need to be filled to, to maintain and sustain this. And the likes of VMware have made our work, um, I'm going to say, uh, more efficient. I wouldn't say it's easy, but it's made us uh, our lives more efficient, providing the, the uptime, the service level guarantee, and also the efficiencies to our end customers. Um, a lot of people also um, are worried about bill shock um, when you come to traditional hyperscalers. Um, we, we took this into consideration. We created packages or, or scalability solutions where you can specify your disk, memory, CPU, and use it as you see in your cluster. So in other words, you could provision, you know, large VMs, small VMs, and still have that ceiling where you never pass. And as I said, you can scale up and down as you see every month. Um, the other thing I want to stress is this platform is built on one of the most amazing technologies I've ever seen, which is vSAN. Um, vSAN has really enabled your databases, your VMs to basically replicate. And I know I said this before, instantaneously to another data center. So if this data center ever went down and crashed within, I'm not gonna say instant, when I mean instant, within seconds, that server would be detected or that downtime will be detected and your services will boot up. So your database rights would happen instantaneously on both locations. Um, our customers have, uh, have loved the availability. Our customers have loved the, the, the actual performance. And most of all, we love providing the protection and ease of use on this platform. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm very excited about the platform, as you can tell. Thanks, Pete. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really awesome. It's been fun designing this product and just, you know, ticking all the boxes, making sure we go above and beyond with everything, especially 
you know, performance, like you said, Pete, like our VDC runs on all NVMe drives for the tier storage, you know, each drive pulling over a million IOPS is insane performance. So, you know, um, compared to other providers, we're really happy with what we've done here. Um, Static is the word, yeah. Yeah, so, all right, let's go to the next slide. And uh, Awesome, so I'm uh, gonna pass it back to Sinead for a few minutes just to talk about how, um, oh, sorry, I forgot to mention, we, we use vCloud Director, which Sinead uh, mentioned before, and that's the user interface that you can use to provision everything um, and control your all your security policies and everything in, in VDC. Um, so, Sinead, can you just tell us how um, vCloud Director facilitates application deployment? Sure. Thank you, um, Tim. So, um, we partnered uh, with Service of Australia to help uh, to design uh, and automate the application deployment. Uh, what I said previously, uh, we have the VMware Cloud Director in the heart of our platform, and it integrates with um, other software and other um, uh, services that's available. Uh, currently, uh, Service of Australia uh, works with us um, to use um, our marketplace uh, with our um, Bitnami uh, catalog and our uh, application catalog, which are secure, uh, uh, which enables them to do the secure application deployment. Also, it automates and gives them that self-service ability uh, to be able to do that. So what that means is um, they, they give you uh, this um, uh, catalog, a private catalog um, available to you. And it, it means those uh, catalog is all secure and, and available to you to deploy as many as uh, applications you need to uh, deploy. And they are um, the, you know, the pre-built templates uh, yeah. it's been, it's been um, uh, put through. So uh, that, that, that is in a nutshell to how we um, actually enable with the um, APIs and integration into our uh, uh, VMware Cloud Director. And that's the main uh, 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 jinx of the platform. Sinead, could I just ask a quick question off the top of your sure. head? Do you know how many different application um, uh, templates are available if you had to throw a number in the Tanzu and? Ten, thousands, I think, um, you know, yeah. Thousands of them, yeah, um, three or five thousand. I, I can't remember on top of yeah, my head. Maybe Dennis might have an idea. <laughs> yeah. I've lost count. I've yeah, I lost count, <laughs> but I know it's thousands. It really so, does help developers to just do rapid deployments of MySQL servers pre-hardened and pre-built. -pre and yeah. it could be MariaDB, exactly. I've seen, I've seen, you know, uh, other pre-made packages. I mean, there's I couldn't, I couldn't see the naming them for hours, but it, it, it's been a very um, uh, enlightening list um, that's helped many of our customers just rapidly deploy standard application stacks. So thank you for that. Yeah, and on top of the pre-built ones that are provided by uh, VMware and other providers, you can like subscribe to catalogs of, of apps and download them and deploy them easily. You can and also can create your own ones too, yeah. yeah. So you can create a VM, you can make all the changes to it, secure it, install your applications, and then you can just make that into a template where you can deploy as many copies. Um, one way we've seen people use it, it is um, via API. So let's just put it into a real world scenario. Let's say you've got a web server and a database server and you've got a load balancer in front of it. Um, and, you know, during peak times of the week, you might have a sale running. Um, your web server is, is experiencing higher and higher load. You could have a script running on that web server uh, to monitor the load of that. And then, you know, if, if you see the CPU getting saturated on that VM, you could fire off some automation to the vCloud Director API uh, to deploy another copy of your web VM template, um, scale out horizontally, add it into the application stack, um, and basically, you know, tell the load balancer to add that to the backend pool of, of servers. So you can dynamically scale your applications with it, with the templates and the API, um, which I think is a really, really cool thing that a lot of people are getting into because it's so flexible. You can go up and then once, you know, once the sales finish and it goes back to normal, okay. you can just automatically destroy that new web server it's not needed anymore and Absolutely. you can save resources save money so that's one way to use it um 
Awesome. So thank you very much, Sinead, for explaining how the um, templating and the application deployment works. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, this one's right. for Dennis, and um, he's going to talk about micro-segmentation, which is a really important concept to grasp uh, when it comes to security. Um, thanks, Dennis. Yeah, sure. So uh, one of the key selling points of using VMware NSX is uh, micro-segmentation, the idea of micro-segmentation. So this terminology is not created by VMware. It has been in the, in the market for uh, in that industry for quite some time. Uh, but it was very difficult to implement uh, before uh, VMware NSX. Why is that? It's because uh, back then you literally need to connect uh, your servers directly to a firewall and that is not going to be cheap. So because uh, we run in software and the virtual machines are connected to our hypervisor or sitting on our hypervisor, we can literally put a firewall in front of each and every VM. So just imagine each and every VM has its own dedicated firewall and personalized firewall where you can you know um, create uh, uh, specific rules just for specific virtual machines if you ever wanted to of course it would be crazy if you have hundreds of virtual machines and to manage hundreds of firewall rules i mean hundreds of firewalls itself it's very difficult but uh, vmware has created or nsx has created a way to easily group these vms and easily apply rules to these vms so you can go in into VMware Cloud Director and you can create uh, objects, right? Uh, uh, criteria for how do you want to implement the firewall rules. You can say the objects with specific VM names or with VM names containing X, Y, Z, for example. And what it will do is you will hunt or look for every single VM that matches the criteria and it will implement the firewall rules for those virtual machines itself. And that way, you know, just like um, the ransomware, right? Um, we all know that let's say it is hitting certain windows virtual machines and you can easily look for you know create a firewall saying that any windows machine virtual machine uh, let's say windows 2003 windows server 2003 let's apply this specific rule for a temporary basis because you want to prevent east west uh, 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 exploitation of the ransomware so just like wanna cry right we know that it hits a certain part uh, that the sys file port we, what, what we want to do is we block off the, the CIFS and, and it will solve the problem. So we went to, we just create a rule saying that any VM with a destination of um, uh, Windows Server 2003, which we know one of our dates, we will block the, the file sharing ports and, and then you're there, right? You, you'll go to every single Windows virtual machine and block that. And uh, on top of that, because we, uh, we virtualize all software, uh, all networking functions, we also have routing within the hypervisor, which allows optimized network performance. And hence, from your perspective, you get the most, I mean, it's essentially memory copy between one VM to another virtual machine, if we co-locate uh, co them within the same hypervisor. So it will defy all networking concepts. When you transfer a file, it's just a split second because it's essentially just memory copy at the end of the day. Okay. Thanks, Tim. On to you. Awesome. Thanks, Dennis. That's really interesting about the uh, distributed routing, how that can copy the, the memory straight across to another VM. Um, that just increases the bandwidth between the VMs to insane levels, which is awesome. Um, and yeah, we use this in, in the VDC products and that's, you know, one of the main reasons why we decided to go with NSXT for this. Um, and let's go to the next slide, please. Awesome. So, uh, for VDC, uh, we mentioned that there's self-service backups, and I'm going to talk about that. It's, it's powered by Veeam, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard. They're a really big name in, in backup solutions. Um, so what we've done is we've partnered with Veeam for this product, with, uh, and we've implemented the plugin that they wrote specifically for vCloud Director. I think we're one of the only providers using this um, from what I've heard from Veeam. Um, it allows you to log directly into the Veeam through uh, vCloud Director and set up your own backup policies. So you can back up one or many or all of your um, virtual applications that reside in your VDC. Uh, you can set retention policies. You can say, for example, I want to back up this VM every day and just keep a few weeks, or I want to export some backups to um, archival storage. Um, you can have different policies for different VMs. and um, 
the awesome thing about it is, is you only pay for what you use and you only pay for the storage. So you're not paying for any res restoration fees. You're not paying for the bandwidth to back up the VMs between different, um, you know, storages or anything like that. It's simplified. You back up whatever you want, whatever policies you want, and you just pay for the backup storage usage, um, which I think is, you know, in this day and age, comparing to other backup providers is very, very competitive. And just the fact that it makes it so simple um, and it's all within the same uh, mm. UI as well. Yep. So you don't Can have I to go to another platform. Yep. Um, how does your immutable backups work when it comes to ransomware? Yeah, awesome. So uh, in one of the latest versions of Veeam, they introduced a feature called immutable backups, which we've also implemented with this platform. Um, we have at least, so we've set it to seven days and it means that you can't remove backup for seven days. And the main reason for doing that is, for example, if you had a disgruntled employee, we've seen this with some companies in the past where, you know, you've got a disgruntled employee, they've got logins to your platform. They want to cause some harm to you. They'll, they can go in, delete your virtual machines and they can delete your backups. Well, something like this with immutable backups means that the backups can't be touched. So, you know, there's no way for them to somebody to go in and delete those backups. There's no human error. No one can accidentally delete a backup. They're, they're immutable. They can't be, they're read only. They can't be touched for at least seven days. Um, so yeah, well, we're excited about that feature. That's a good time. Um, awesome. All right. Uh, I think that was the last, yeah, that was the last slide for the VDC product. So thank you very much uh, for listening to the VDC presentation. We're going to go to uh, question and answer, questions and answers now with the audience. And I want to also thank um, all of our partners for joining us today as well um, and talking about their um, specific pieces of the puzzle and how they contribute to cloud technology. So thank you, everyone. And let's go to the Q&A. No worries. Um, I see there's a questionnaire um, about do we need an IT team for VDC? Um, let me be um, honest. In traditional workloads, when you're managing your own VMware or Hyper-V, whatever that looks like, you need to have your own certified engineers. You need to manage your, 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 your own networks and everything. With VDC and the updates and security, with VDC, we manage the whole infrastructure layer. We manage all the security um, in terms of keeping it continuously running and updated. We manage all the hypervisors. We order update the hypervisors, migrate your VMs across, and then start to basically upgrade the hypervisors live. So you don't in, in have to have an IT team managing your cloud workloads. You still technically need your IT team to manage your specific application. Like say you needed a, your own database administrator or you needed someone that, you know, that manages your CAD applications and stuff like that. You still need to have that in place and ma in, ensure that is running. But in terms of having a, a whole IT team managers, no, you don't. It's all the infrastructure level, the availability level, the network level, the DDoS protection, and all that is managed by Servers Australia. What else awesome. Thanks, Pete. We've got another question. Um, oh, OPEX. Uh, yeah, how, how does the VDC work for OPEX? Yeah, yeah. I'll let you OPEX. take that one as well, Pete. So I mean, if you don't mind, I would yeah. answer that as well. So traditionally, when it comes to SMEs, right, specifically SMEs here, you would have to order a, a Dell server um, or two, um, some storage, a little local SAN. You would have to buy network gear, um, and then you would have to ensure the room is secure, it's insured, it's cooled um, and maintained. I mean, these exercises are very expensive exercises. A typical micro data center will cost a business on average, I'm gonna make a call, $200,000 every three years in terms of you know, keeping the services updated, the SANS replaced and everything. Um, and so when you convert this over to an OPEX model um, and say you reduce your cost, you, you're spending you know, $500 or a thousand, whatever that amount looks per month, um, it allows you to take that head awake as a business from a capital, capital maintenance and a cap, initial large capital investment and a monetize that over a yearly pe period. Um, and it really does allow your business to redistribute that, that large sum towards your business instead of you know, every three years investing a huge amount of capital into that. Um, once you actually itemize this all into you know, line items and the cost of running your own workloads in your own data centers, um, even in co-location, and 
I'm going to, Equinix, uh, Harry will mark this. Uh, we're one of Equinix's largest partner. We have 400 racks of co-location. So they're our, you know, our, our great customers as well. But we, are, we see this sort of expenditure and maintenance involved in managing our own infrastructure. So um, we're a big believer in OPEX models um, because it's what we live and breathe and do. Service Australia are experts at it. Um, and we, we make it um, our daily lives, like, the, like from the network level, from the hardware level, from the software level, VMware and the infrastructure providers like um, Equinix for the facilities. This is our bread and butter. And so converting that to an OPEX model um, makes it a lot, uh, attainable for smaller businesses who don't have that initial outlay. Awesome. Thanks, Pete. That's a really good answer. Thank you. Um, I got one here from Shane, which I can answer. How hard is that? How hard is it for our team to upgrade or downgrade the resources uh, that they need in VDC? Uh, thanks, Shane, for that question. It's actually really easy. Um, that was one of the main focuses that we had when designing this is we knew that um, modern day workloads, they scale a lot. They change a lot. They're not static anymore. Uh, so uh, for VDC, you could basically just log into the portal and you can just assign resources and they are provisioned within 60 seconds or so. Um, and same for downgrading. Uh, as long as you're not using the resources, you can just take them away. Um, and yeah, it's just all done. You can just basically, you know, move the slider, click save, and it'll scale your VDC to whatever size you need. Yeah. Um, awesome. And part of understand, Tim, the storage as well when going down, um, it also will check you're not using it before going down and stuff as well. Yeah, that's right. It won't let you scale it down if you're already using the store. Like if you've got VMs sitting there that are using a terabyte, then obviously you can't scale the VDC down lower than that Other because than that. it's already in use. But absolutely. if you remove those VMs, then you could scale it down. Yeah, absolutely. There's another question by Thomas here. Um, would it be suitable for Windows um, remote desktop environments. Um, I'm going to say straight up, it's probably the most used product in this environment. Why? Um, the simple fact is um, NSXT, um, especially when it comes to security, um, you want to be running VPN services back to the cloud. Um, you want to be running, you know, secure tunnels between your offices and the cloud. And also um, and you want to have the performance. A lot of businesses these days are running on, you know, 100 megabit connections in their offices. Now, that seems like a lot. Let's just say if it, you know, they've got 200 megabits in their offices. Um, the issue with that is um, users these days have got, let's just say your business has 50 staff. Every user has access to at least 20 to 50 megabits. Now, all it takes is for a few users to accidentally do something, copy some files, and the whole link gets saturated. So you're going to get packet loss. You're going to get all sorts of bottlenecks appearing that you're used, not used to seeing. And this is only going to be amplified as you go um, into the future when you actually start um, increasing our MBN speeds. And hopefully we get a gigabit one day from the great Australian government, hopefully. Um, but the likes of um, even, you know, Elon Musk's new um, Starlink system. I mean, we've got it. Uh, the CEO, Jared's actually got one of them and he's pulling 300 megabits. And so you actually will start saturating your micro offices. And so when it comes to Windows desktops, um, um, remote desktop services, it makes sense to host these in the cloud because we're all, you know, got hundreds of gigabits connectivity to the internet and um, we host some serious, um, I'm going to say media uh, heavy organizations that do massive amounts of output. Um, and that's why it's really good to run RDP services off cloud providers. Yeah, thanks, Pete. That's awesome. Um, all right, we've got another question from Brian here. Uh, living in a great part of the world, how reliant are you on uh, to outstanding telephony? Are you with Telstra or others? Uh, this must be a very important part of your strategy. Mm. I mean, I read that two ways. Um, it says here, so uh, when you mean tele, you talk about connectivity, um, our connectivity with, I'm gonna assume that's what the question is about. Um, we are very strategic when it comes to our connectivity. Um, as um, Harry has mentioned, we use Equinix Peering. We've got 100 gig ports everywhere. We use um, multiple transit providers. We have multiple routers and multiple data centers. So we're very reliant on uh, what's called multi-homed um, connectivity back to the data centers. So if we ever lose a data center, the connectivity back to the data center is always available via another path. Um, I think it's very important to understand that providers, if you find and I'm not, please, I apologize if I'm offending any smaller providers, but if a provider has only a footprint in one data center, I mean, I'm not gonna say it, it's not a bad thing, right? Um, as I said, Equinix has got, you know, five nines, 
But if they ever have a router issue and stuff and they lose their core rack, then it's very important, especially for larger businesses who have, um, you know, um, high staff count or high clients, that your provider has multiple data centers. So if one goes down, your services will continue running out of a third. Um, so that is very, uh, if that's what, what you were meaning when you were meant by telephony connectivity like Telstra and others, then yeah, that, that is the, the type of solution we offer. Um, what else is there? Um, XP, um, one of our not? locations of data centers. Um, at the moment, uh, obviously, like Equinix, um, if you were to ask Equinix that question, that one of the they are the world's carrier, are you the world's largest data center provider still? Yes. Yep, that's it. So they're everywhere. Um, in terms of um, VDC, specifically this product, it's available at the moment in our Sydney campuses across, you know, multiple Equinix data centers in the Sydney basin. Um, we are playing, if I could use that word, with DR zones and other zones that will come live in the, in the coming quarters. Um, so there definitely will be the ability to have um, different VDCs in different states. Um, there seems to be another uh, question here about um, why do we not use hyperscalers and why do we need VDC? <laughs> um, listen, um, I love hyperscalers. I, they've changed the, the, the industry. They've helped businesses like petroleum companies, airlines, banks, anyone that needs to scale up a thousand instances. There is definitely a need for that because these organizations don't have to spend the money on buying a thousand servers and stuff. But when it comes to SMEs, and this, 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 this webinar is specifically around small to medium enterprises, which compose of one to, I think it's 199 employees, you've got to understand that um, bill shock is a thing. And I'm not going to point anyone out specifically, but when you move to any large hyperscale provider, um, there is basically, uh, every time you move data in and out, there's an ingress and egress charge. Every time you move data sideways, there's a charge. Every time you do more than your IOPS assigned, there's a charge. Every time you um, provision, you know, a different type of storage, there's a charge. I mean, build complexity is a thing. And I'm going to thank VMware for their cloud health product. They also have a product that actually counters bill shock, um, which is something uh, we have looked at um, and potentially could in the near future, no hints. <laughs> uh, but it definitely is um, an issue. And it, I, I thank you for bringing that up because with VDC, you don't have that. We don't charge you know, for outbound data, there's only one set fee of your, about, we don't charge for trend, uh, conversations with your traffic between your VMs. We don't have hidden charges. You have a set amount that you commit to, and that is what it is. If you choose to scale up, you will know that your cost will go from $500 a month to 600. That's it. There is a limit. There is no other, excluding your backups, right? The backups is 10 cents per gig or 5 cents, depending on how much you use. There is a few little variables, but the actual overall cost, you won't experience any sort of bill shock there. Yeah, that's right. So you set your own limits um, and you can't scale past them automatically without, you know, manually raising those limits. Whereas with, you know, traditional hyperscalers, they will just let you deploy and deploy and deploy and deploy and deploy. And if you have a rogue script, you know, you've made a mistake in one of your automation templates or something like that, you know, you wake up the next day and you have a look at your inventory with one of the hyperscalers, you've got thousands of VMs running. You're like, oh no, this is going to cost me an arm and a leg. Um, you know, so those kind of situations we avoid with our practice. You can't, you know, we've made sure that that's not going to happen to you. So that's really important. Yeah. Um, um, can I add something, um, Peter? Um, absolutely. Uh, addition, to, addition to that, what we have seen is um, we have a business unit called cloud, cloud economics. We looked at the you know, cloud end to end and what you're talking about the hyperscalers. There is a huge uh, effect is the refactoring economics, which is a big, big decision making point for a lot of uh, the um, you know, uh, enterprises. They look at it and they go, uh, I can move like 80% maybe of my workloads easily. It's not gonna cost me much, maybe in three months, but the 20% is gonna cost me millions of dollars and overrun project, I still have to you know, leave it. So where you're looking at that refactoring cost um, um, and, and the cost of the cloud economics, uh, comes to a big effect uh, where you can actually offer a uh, the you know both of the uh, the words words of the like uh, you know the economics of the cloud.
but at the same time, you give them opportunity to keep their workloads the, the way they run it on their private cloud. I, I'd like to actually extend that a little bit um, and explain my experience that I've had quickly, uh, if I can. Um, business owners, especially SMEs and startups, need to make sure that their business is always portable. You don't know when you are going to change ownership or change suppliers and ensuring your business is portable. I cannot stress how important it is, especially at the CIO, CEO level and you know, business owners level, that if, say, heaven forbid, Service Australia, something happens, um, I don't know, we partner with someone you don't like or we change networks and you don't like or whatever happens, right? Let's just, I'm calling out here um, a negative situation. If, you're, if you build your product to a specific hyperscaler or a platform that is not universal, then your migration is very hard out and around. Um, we chose VMware because, let me be honest, you type in the word VMware and any other hyperscalers, they will import them workloads. But once you're there, it doesn't make it easy to get out. So we chose to use VMware. So it enables our customers to ensure that their VMs are still portable when they choose to move on or move to a sideways or different platform, say they want to use private cloud, you know, dedicated infrastructure and their own, you know, high performance computing. Um, it really allows a balanced um, um, a level when it comes to business decisions of moving workloads and, and, and yeah. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, we, just to reiterate, you know, moving an application to a, a big uh, hyperscaler, you might have to change the foundation of the way that application works. If you're going to use the microservices, the object storage, all these kind of things that they want to make your application like cloud, um, it it is a huge job. Even even for small applications, moving um, to changing the, to those APIs to those different methods of of running things, it's huge. Yeah. Whereas with VMware, you know, you run it on a traditional virtual machine in the end, so you know it's easy to migrate. You, there's there's multiple tools to you know, convert a physical machine into a virtual machine. Um, Replicate VMware your converter. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So it, it stays as more of a traditional workload, which makes it way easier to manage and way more portable between different platforms. Um, there's one last final question that's on here, um, which is from Brian. I can read that two ways. Um, are, we expect, are we to expect a revision in our cost to us soon? I assume you either are a current customer of VDC or asking, will there be cost revisions? Um, just like any hyperscaler or any platform, every 18, I'm going to say 18 to 36 months, the platform will be revised, new processes will come out, new technology, NVMe will triple, and the existing customer workloads will be discounted, and then a new revision will come up. It would be VDC2, or there would be a new revision to it where our current customers would Alternatively, they can move to the new one. So there will always be some sort of cost reduction as the product age. And that goes with every product. It's not just VDC specific. There should always be um, a cost reduction after 36 months, which really you know, allows an extra uh, percentage of income to end businesses. Um, and if, if your providers aren't doing this, whether you're with us or not, you should always contact them and ask them for a better deal at 36 months because it is only fair that you've been loyal to them and 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 they provided as long as they provide a good service to you and everything you want to continue they will also honor that as well to you well it looks like we're getting close to the end of time eh, Tim? yeah yeah um if there's no more questions we've got just two minutes left but i think i don't see any more questions coming in so i think yeah i think that's it no awesome worries. thank you very much everybody thanks for attending the webinar today uh, I hope Thank everybody you, got something everyone that interesting attended. out of it and uh, we'll hopefully see you in the next one. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thanks everybody. See you, everyone.